Good morning. Good to see you again. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, thank you for praying for us at Beaufort Memorial Hospital. We appreciate that greatly. We are praying that we soon hit this peak of this latest surge and we see the numbers go down. We haven't gotten there yet, but please keep praying. And I know there's a lot of frustration about the vaccine. I wish I had some news for you. I don't. Uh, that's not where I move and, and live and work at, uh, at Beaufort Memorial. Uh, just hang in there, please. Uh, we're not in charge of the distribution. DHEC is in charge of the statewide distribution. And, and um, I, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I know we've had a team of people that have been working hard to respond to all of those inquiries about appointments. One of the folks that I know personally told me that she was trying to respond to 12,000 emails. Uh, and that's just one person. So uh, pray, pray for those folks, pray for the distribution. Uh, and, and please um, uh, help us to help one another in that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing. Masks, hand sanitizing, distancing. Please keep doing those things. Second um, Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 today. We, uh, I, I appreciated the prayer, Scott wherever you are, I appreciate that prayer so much. We don't know what's gonna happen over the next few days. We pray for smooth transition. We pray for peace in our nation. We pray for people to come together. Uh, there's much more that, that unites us than divides us. And especially those of us who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in Him, we have become a part of his kingdom. We're kingdom citizens. And, uh, there's, and our unity is in Christ. Our unity is not in just things that we might happen to agree on, but our unity is a person. It's Jesus. And uh, we, we live in these times of uh, of unrest and contentiousness. And so today I hope that we can find some encouragement in this scripture today uh, that will help us to discover that there's an opportunity for continuous renewal, even in these times. So 2 Corinthians 4, uh, we're going to start in verse 7, but I want to focus, I'll put my focus in verses 16 uh, through 18. Um, and so uh, if you have your Bible, please uh, uh, follow along, and I believe it's going to be on the screens here, and if you're watching this either by live stream or, or a little bit later, uh, please follow in your, in your Bible. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now, Stop right there for just a moment. The treasure that we have, of course, is Jesus. No one can take that treasure from you. That's your treasure. And the jar of clay, of course, is this habitation, this body that we live in. It's fragile. It's, uh, it, it's, it's not going to last forever. And so the reason why we have this treasure in this Habitation is so that God will be glorified. God will be magnified. And, and to show that to all who see us, to, who, who witness us. And uh, he goes on, verse 8, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over.
over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Verse 15 talks about how that we're involved in spreading the good news of the gospel and we're involved in witnessing to what Christ has done in us and through us and for us so that more and more people will be attracted to that and in turn join the kingdom of God, the family of God, become disciples of Jesus Christ and all to the glory of God. So all of these things that Paul has mentioned in, in verses 7 through 15. Now we come to 16. So we do not lose heart. There's something bigger going on here. There's something greater going on here than what we can see. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen. Don't be distracted, defeated, disillusioned, discouraged by the things that we see. There's the danger. As we look not to the things that that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're temporary. They're not going to last. They're going to, they're going to pass. But the things that are unseen are eternal. So Paul it has discovered the secret of not losing heart, of, of not dwelling in discouragement and defeat and disillusionment. He's learned that secret. And he has, he has a right to, to say this. If you've been coming to church or reading your Bible or participating in Bible studies, you know that. You know that he has a right to say that. He, he has a clear right to say this. Paul's been through a lot. In fact, that's the way he started his ministry when, when God got him on that road to Damascus. And he went on into Damascus and, and uh, he lost his sight. And he, he told Ananias there in Damascus, said, Ananias, I want you to go see Paul. And I want you, this is what I want you to do. And Ananias says, you sure, man, this, this guy is after the church. He's, he's, this may be a trick. And he said, yes, you go and see Paul because I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so Paul, you know, Paul went into this with his eyes opened understanding this wasn't going to be a joy ride. This wasn't going to be a cruise. But there was going to be suffering and, and, and there's going to be challenge. And so, so Paul has a right to talk to us, to speak to us these many centuries later and say, hey, there's something bigger going on here. There's something greater going on here than what you can see around you. And we don't need to lose heart in the middle of all of this. We've got, we've got a focus. There's the kingdom of God. There are people who need to know Jesus there. And, this is a, and we can see this as an opportunity, if we will, to let the light of Christ shine forth and to let others be touched by what they see. So that word that Paul uses, we're wasting away, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, 
that word that he uses that, that translates a word that's used here and five other times in the New Testament. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about those there. I want to mention three of those other ways. In Luke 12, 33, the Bible says, Provide yourselves a treasure in the heavens where no moth destroys. That's the same word. Destro- that where it's translated destroys in that verse and wasting away and in, in where Paul uses it over here in 2 Corinthians 16. And that's the picture of, you know, you, you've got this wonderful wool coat that keeps you warm in, on a day like this. And once March rolls around, you're going to put that coat away in the closet. When next winter rolls around, you go to your closet and you discover your beautiful warm wool coat is now moth-eaten and you can't use it anymore. Okay, it's not even good enough to give to Goodwill or Salvation Army or whatever. But that's the word that is, that's, that's the implication in that verse. Revelation 8 9 says that a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. That's the same word as Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Wasting away. It's translated wasting away here and were destroyed there. And they were destroyed, all the living creatures, a third of the living creatures and a third of the ships were destroyed by a great mountain of burning fire being thrown into the sea, capsizing and consuming thousands of ships. And then uh, Romans eleven eighteen, 18, uh, excuse me, Revelation eleven eighteen. 18, the nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for destroying the destroyers of the earth. And God will one day destroy the destroyers of the earth. Same word. Translated destroyers, destroy, uh, destroy here and uh, wasting away by Paul. That's the word that Paul used here in 2 Corinthians 4.16, our outer, our outer body is being destroyed. The inner self is being renewed day by day. Now, many of us here have lived a while, got some time under our belt, been around the block a little bit. You know, I, I don't know about you, I, you know, I, I, it, you know, getting old is not for wimps. <laughs> it's a challenge every day. I used to be able to drop something on the floor, zip right down, pick it up, and stand back up on two feet. Give me about 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> I'll get down there, but give me a little while here, get back up. Well, wasting away. I feel okay. Wife, thank God, my wife says, you look okay. (laughs) But things don't work like they used to. The outer body is wasting away. The inner self is being renewed day by day. Now there's, there's two sources of this destruction Wasting away, being destroyed, all of that. There's two sources of that. There's fallen nature and fallen people. Fallen nature, the, the, the natural world is under God's curse of futility and corruption and pain and death. And, and that, that results from what happened back in Eden. Adam and Eve disobeyed God at that point. Sin entered the world through them. And, and uh, Romans 8, 20 uh, through 23 says this. The creation was subjected to futility in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So not only is God working in us, but in us and through us, the creation itself is expectant for the renewal that God will bring. But in the meantime, fallen nature touches us. You see, God saves His children in stages, not all at once. Now, 
you're already forgiven. You're justified because of Christ. If you have trusted in him, that's a fact. But we're not already free from corruption and death. We'll waste away and we'll die. Or we'll be swept away in a flood or struck by lightning or die by some terminal disease. That's fallen nature. That's the first thing that works against us. And the second thing is fallen people. If nature doesn't do us in, people will. There's human carelessness in a car that causes an accident. There's human hostility that overwhelms a person and causes them to do something terrible. And people suffer and die because of that. That's what he mentions when he says in verse 9 that I read a few minutes ago that we're persecuted but not forsaken. We're struck down but not destroyed. That's fallen people who do, do those things, did those things. In verse 12, he says, so death is at work in us. So whether it's fallen nature or fallen people, Paul is being destroyed, being struck down, wasting away, dying. And precisely that situation, probably more bleak than any of us will experience, hopefully, Paul experiences the secret of not losing heart, but being renewed day by day. <laughs> One other thing in verse 16. The experience of not losing heart fades and must be renewed day by day. Discovering the secret of not losing heart is not an experience that lasts a lifetime. It's, a, it's discovering a fountain of life that we return to each and every day. And the secret is that you never have to look anywhere else for life and hope and strength and joy. It's a daily process. There's a necessity of that daily renewal. We're being renewed day by day. Paul didn't say that we're, we'll be renewed and that's going to stay with us forever. No, we have to be renewed day by day. It means the refreshing, renewing, strength-giving drink that you took in the morning that kept you from losing heart must be taken again the next morning or night or noon or whenever. And sometimes you need to take an extra drink on some days because some days are that bad. But you can always find where your strength is and go back to it. The word itself, renew, means that something runs out. We ate breakfast a little while ago before we came. It's running out. <laughs> I'm, we're going to have to eat lunch. And we'll have to eat supper. That's why grocery stores are doing so well. <laughs> and restaurants. I've put gas in the car uh, yesterday, uh, sometime recently, yesterday, I think, Friday, or Friday night, Friday night, yeah. I'll have to put more gas. It runs out. If you've got one of those Teslas, you got to recharge that battery. It runs out. So we need that renewal. We need that renewal. Those are physical things, but spiritually, things run out, and, and we need that daily renewal. Matthew 6, 34 says, Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Maybe you've heard someone say uh, about, uh, you know, when you're worried about something, you're overwhelmed and not worry about something. Someone says, well, don't borrow trouble. Don't. Worry about something that you have no way of controlling or don't know about. You see, worry is basically uh, an overwhelming concern about something that you really don't know is going to happen or not and can't control. And that's why Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So there's a reason for daily renewal. Why we need that? It's for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. Verse 7 says... We have this treasure in jars of clay. Jars, by the way, need refilling day by day. 
to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are weak and He is our strength. How great Thou art! The giver of strength, the giver of hope, and the giver of joy gets all the glory. I don't get the glory. You don't get the glory. I don't want the glory because it belongs to God. So how does this happen? How do we come down to that point? How does all this happen, Marion? This not losing heart, the secret of not losing heart, but being renewed day by day. And this, it's a journey that I'm on. Please understand that. It's a day-by-day -day journey with me. And I just want us to be encouraged because we're in this this time, this space in our nation where we, we need to understand where our true strength, where our true peace, where our true hope and joy come from. And it's not coming from Washington, D.C. It comes from the one who knows us better than we know ourselves and the one who never turns away from us. And the one to whom we can turn to anytime and anywhere. And that's Jesus. So how does this happen? Well, there are two kinds of clues here about that. There's one inside the text and one that's outside the text. And we want to talk about that for just a few minutes. Paul uses this verb, renew, in one other place. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. <clears throat> You have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed, how? In knowledge after the image of its creator. So knowledge is very significant here. So it's in knowledge that we, uh, that we come to this. Now I want to say this, I want to say this carefully. This is more than knowledge, but it's not less than knowledge. And, and, and again, I want to say this very carefully because knowledge alone will not do it. You and I both probably know people who have a lot of knowledge, but very little security and confidence in the Lord. Okay, so knowledge without the Holy Spirit to guide and apply what you learn produces pride. Knowledge alone without the Holy Spirit to guide and apply and help and encourage, that produces pride if we're not careful. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. So no Christian is being renewed day by day so as not to lose heart without acquiring some biblical truth, some biblical knowledge, and absorbing that into their minds. In other words, it takes more than knowledge to be renewed day by day, but not less than knowledge. God has designed the glory of the human being such that the condition of our heart is greatly influenced by the content of our head, what we consciously focus on. The issue is not losing heart. Uh, the, it, it, the, our first clue says that not losing heart is deeply connected to not losing truth. So we acquire the knowledge that we need. We acquire more knowledge about who it is we walk with, how he walks with us, and how we walk with him and follow after him. We acquire that knowledge, and it's, it, it's acted out and motivated in our hearts. See, if the knowledge doesn't get from your head to your heart, it's just stuck up there. It's when it's in your heart that you don't lose heart. Okay? So the second clue is that the head of knowing serves the heart of feeling. There are two words that I want us to look at in the next couple of minutes, the word so in verse 16 and the word for in verse 17. So that word, the two verses that are the three verses that we're looking at this morning, that word so, 
uh, in verse 16 connects that verse with what Paul had said before. It's kind of like therefore. He talked about treasure being in jars of clay and all of that. I'll talk about that for just a minute. And so that... Uh, and then the next word we want to talk about is the word for in verse 17. For this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. So recall those previous truths that we talked about. Verse 7. The treasure of Christ and his gospel are in weak bodies, jars of clay, so that the glory goes to God. So we don't lose heart. Do you see the great favor that God has done us, has given us? Because he chose us, us human beings, who back in the Garden of Eden willingly chose to, disobe- dis- to be disobedient to God and allow sin to enter the earth. He still selected us to receive that great treasure. And we have that treasure in these weak bodies that we inhabit. So... We don't lose heart. Verse 8, we are afflicted, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So we don't lose heart. We experience all those things. Paul experienced all those things. But he said, it's okay. I'm not losing heart. Verse 14 says that God will raise us from the dead with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. So we do not lose heart. There's something greater going on here. There's something bigger going on here. And verse 15 says, through our suffering, grace extends to more and more people and increases thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Paul fills his mind, you see, Paul fills his mind with these heart-renewing truths, and he invites us into the same experience. We are renewed day by day by putting these glorious realities into our minds. And God has designed, here again, God has designed the glory of the human being such that the condition of the heart is greatly influenced by the content of the head, by what we focus our minds on. So my question to you this morning is, what are you focusing your mind on? What are you looking at? What's being said to you that you're absorbing on your social media accounts? What are you reading in the news reports that come across your computer screen or in your newspaper or on your television? And what are you being discouraged by or distracted by or disillusioned by? And where are you finding your strength, your hope, your joy. Because you won't find it on any of those, except if you have friends who are posting Bible verses or you're paying attention to good programming on the TV. There is some good programming on TV somewhere. I'm, you, know, you might have to dig a little bit, but it's there. So... So, so where, where are you, you, you doing, do, where are you acquiring this? Paul fills his mind with these heart-renewing truths. And he invites us to join him with that. And so, now we look at the next word, the four in verse 17. You know how these words work. So, therefore, and for, because... So this this word for, verse 17, compares to all the challenges that he's just mentioned. And verse 18 emphasizes this. Look at what it says. Set your mind on these things, unseen things, glorious things. Meditate on these things. Memorize them. Chew on them. 
you know, before you start your day, get with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit in this word and fill your mind with his great and glorious promises and his encouragement and let that settle deep into your mind and sink into your heart and let that be the motivation so that you do discover being renewed day by day. Every moment of affliction is meaningful. Every moment of affliction is meaningful. Sometimes you don't think so. I can walk the halls of Beaufort Memorial Hospital and I can, I can find there people who are suffering terribly. And they're wondering what's next. And I've asked, and, and I've been asked those questions before as a chaplain. What's, what comes next? How do I deal with this? What do I do to get ready? And we talk about that as much as the patient's willing to. And I find other patients who are, who are suffering terribly. And they don't know, they don't have any idea what's next, but they know that God has prepared a place. And they're, even though their bodies are wasting away, their inner self is still being renewed day by day. And I come away I come away from that encounter as the one who's been blessed in the midst of me trying to be a blessing. Every moment of affliction is meaningful. These 70, 80, 90 years, whatever they might be, they are, they are nothing compared to the eternal weight and greatness and glory that we will see and we will be. And folks, this inglorious, shameful, painful affliction is light in comparison. Now, I, I can't speak to you as one who has been there. I'm just like you. But I'm taking the word of God at face value, and I'm trusting in the God who put together this Bible and saying that to you along with Paul because he said it before I did. You see, Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. Even a lifetime of affliction is light. And remember, this is Paul talking. Paul had really suffered throughout all of his life and then comes the most amazing because or for of all. We do not lose heart for every single moment in the path of our affliction and the path of obedience, whether from sickness or from slander, fallen nature or fallen people, all of it is meaningful. Every single moment, every single second, that is all of it, unseen to our eyes, it's producing something, preparing something for us in eternity. This glory that God will show us and will give us is beyond imagination. 2 Corinthians 2.9 says, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, God has prepared for those who love Him. And more than that, there are special glories in the age to come that are brought about by your particular afflictions, my particular afflictions, whatever it is that you have suffered with in your life because of Jesus Christ or because of fallen nature, because of fallen people. God takes note of that and it's meaningful and gives you in preparation. It's producing for you something in eternity that will be beyond your imagination. You can't see it now. The world can't see it, but we will see it. 
As I close today, I want to talk just a moment about the tragedy of John the Baptist's death. You know the story. Probably heard the story before, heard a sermon about it, or studied it in the Bible, or read about it. And from one angle, this must be one of the most tragic stories in the Bible. Jesus said, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, in Matthew 11, 11. And now uh, John the Baptist is in prison because John said publicly to King Herod, said, no, King Herod, it's not right for you to have your brother Philip's wife, Herodias. You're living in adultery. He just spoke the truth. And so Herodias implored Herod to put John in prison. Herod liked John, even though he said those things to him. So John is sitting alone in jail. He's wondering, is this how the kingdom's supposed to come? In fact, he sent his disciples to Jesus, remember that? And said, hey, is this, you know, I'm in, I'm in prison. You're, you've started your ministry, and that's wonderful, and that's great. Is this how, you know, is this how it's supposed to work? And of course, Jesus sent back message will tell John what's going on the blind see the lame walk the deaf are made to hear and the kingdom of God is growing and so Herod throws a birthday party for himself and for a little bonus for the guests he has his stepdaughter Salome dance and she was so pleasing to Herod he was so taken and everybody else was uh, absorbed into that dance. So Herod promised whatever she wanted as a gift. She consults her mother Herodias and Herodias of course hates John the Baptist and, and, um, and so she comes back to Herod and says the gift that I want is the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So two simple verses, it's done. What must have been going through John's mind? at that time. He's sitting in prison hoping for a release to continue his ministry and his life. The door swings open and there are two men, one with a sword. A moment of silence. And then the executioner says, come over here and kneel. If you struggle, we'll bind you. Why? What's going on? What happened? They liked the king's daughter's dance and she asked for your head. And the last thing that John is left thinking as his short life ends, a dance, a dance, my life for a dance. And we want to cry out, meaningless, meaningless except for one thing, we have looked to the unseen. We have heard God say in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. This too seem, is seemingly irrational, pointless, meaningless murder of a great man is preparing, producing for him an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It was not meaningless. At that moment, eternity changed. A special particular weight of glory was forged for John the Baptist forever. And so it will be for you. We don't lose heart. We have something greater, something more glorious, something better that awaits us in eternity. Let's pray. God, you're so good to us. Father, in ways that we can't see, can't know right now, Lord, and we have days 
when we just don't get it. But Father, you've spoken to us through your word, and every time we open it, even if it's just a casual glance, even if it's just a cursory look at a few verses, Lord, you are there speaking to our hearts through our heads. So Father, help us to cling to the eternal, the unseen that never changes, that doesn't shift, that's always accessible and always available and always an anchor for our souls. Lord, we don't know what the next few days are going to hold. We don't know what the next minute is going to hold. But we know that you hold it all in your hands. And so help us to trust you deep in our faith, God. And help us to be encouraged day by day. I pray now for those who might be here who are seeking and searching. And I pray, God, that they have heard something. They have discovered something that they didn't know before. And are drawn now to Jesus. We ask, Father, that you be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.